Support Family is your guy, Mike G, here with C-Dub. And we got a special return guest for you guys today. Um, we are bringing back Josh Pate from the Late Kick and 247 Sports uh, to talk to us a little bit about Auburn's quarterback race. Thanks for joining us, Josh. Yeah, look, I mean, I don't want to make myself at home here, but since we last talked, which feels like about 15 minutes ago, I, I hear rumors that a lot has changed in and around the plane. So, I mean... What have you guys done to the quarterback room is what I want to know down there. So what, what we know right now is, is that Harson's staff, they've attacked the portal hard. And it's provided some opportunities that might not have previously existed for them to fill out some roster needs. Now, after a day, uh, we learned that we may not have a number two QB who's ready. And they went out and they surprised everyone and got T.J. Finley uh, to come into Auburn. Now, the man, this young man made some statements before he got to the planes that I wanted to get your thoughts on. But the first question I want to answer is, do you think that this is about we don't feel good about our number one QB or are they just looking to add depth? All right. Let me tell you how this went from my perspective. So I knew someone who had been with Brian Harson for a little while spoke to him for an extended period of time that very week that we're talking about. So you're coming out of spring and uh, probably like a week after spring, I think it was. And Brian Harson was pretty adamant. Yeah, Bo Nix is our guy. But then again, how would he not be your guy? I guess would be the follow up question. So I think to answer your question, they were saying all the right things down there. I cannot know internally how confident they really were. Like if, if it's just Mike Bobo and Brian Harson and that offensive staff in a room, are they looking at each other, watching that film from spring and saying, all right, there we see a guy we're confident being in the foxhole with? Or do we look at it and say, yeah, I guess he'd be our starter now. But, I mean, that really doesn't say much because who else would it be? We don't have Davis ready. Maybe we think he's still too raw. So, yeah, it is Bo Nix. But our next order of business, call 1-800-PORTAL. Like, we got to see who's in there. We got to see if we can get some help. So, basically – I think the answer to the question of is this just a depth provider or is this legitimate competition, I think it's a yes and a yes. Because I think that coaching staff, I, I'm a believer that there is a scenario that's actually playing out now where they don't have a firm grasp on where they're going to be by week one. I don't think that's the worst thing in the world, by the way. That's not some incriminating statement. But I want you to think about it. I mean, if, if it was me and, and you two guys, like if we had taken over and we were the staff there – what what have we seen, really? We've gone through – it must feel like trying to drink water out of a fire hose, being in their situation and trying to go through spring because you're not inheriting some group of guys that went through a system very similar to the one you're running. So you had to overturn a whole lot, uh, the quarterback position least among them. I think it's very possible they came out of spring – and they they didn't really know. It's like they've gotten the appetizers, but the main course is still in the back somewhere. They don't even they can't even tell you how they like the meal because they haven't seen the meal in front of them. They haven't tasted it yet. And so it's very possible that they looked around and said, "We don't know how this would play out." There's T.J. Finley. We think we can get him. Don't say no. Bring him in. It could very well be that he's our starting quarterback week one. It could very well be that he's nothing more than a depth provider. But I, I think what they looked at is they said. If the answer to a bunch of these questions could be yes, at the very least, it means we're unsettled in that quarterback room. So we got to inject something in there, and we're not in the business right now of turning down a guy who has played starting ball at that position in the SEC already. Josh, Harson talked a lot about uh, that week uh, when, when Finley signed. He talked about having ultimate competitors in the QB room. And he talked about the importance of having competition at every position. In your opinion, when you hear Brian Harson say that and talk in that manner about the quarterback position as well as other positions on the field, what does that speak to you about the culture that Harson is trying to inject into this program? Brian Harson knows culture is going to trickle down from the quarterback position. On the best teams, it always does. And so you want to you want a locker room full of dogs. You want as many alphas on that team as you can get. But like anyone who's played the sport, or if you've just observed it in the proper manner, you know, you don't have, is timidity a word? You don't have timidity at quarterback on an, on an otherwise dominant team. And so he's looking at it, and it's almost like you want to just, you want to grab people by the shoulders. You can't physically do that anymore, but you want to grab them by the shoulders, and, and, and hopefully you don't have to do that. Hopefully it's in them. But if it's not in them, if you don't see that already in your quarterback room, and you don't see it on your team already, then you just try and mix it in yourself. And so 
you know, I got text from a lot of my Auburn buddies and a lot of our folks here at 24 seven, when TJ Finley made the remarks he made, I always noticed this. I don't want to speak ill of anyone, but I always noticed this when a competitor speaks honestly, it always gets two reactions. Other people who are competitive look at it and say, Oh, okay. Cause it's normal. And then people who have not really been in the arena, whether it be a locker room or a boardroom or whatever, they look at it and say, Oh my goodness, I can't believe he said that. And so it's like oil and water. You know what TJ Finley said to me, I yawned when I read it I, I, to me, it's what else would he say? Why would I ever want a guy who says, I see a solid option to be a backup at Auburn and I'm going to come in and fill that role. Why would I ever, that's not the guy you're looking for anyway. That's not the way that the winners recruit. I mean, that's not the way you should recruit at Auburn and you've been in the door 15 minutes. But I think what you have in TJ Finley is you got a guy who at the very least, as as far as we know from what comes out of his mouth, has his mind where it needs to be. That never hurts you, man. If it hurts you, let me put it this way. If that hurts you, if injecting competition into any room on your team hurts you, it means your foundation wasn't where it needs to be to begin with. And that's Auburn and that's any other program. So I think it was certainly a message that's much bigger than just 2021 for Brian Harson. I think we can all agree with that. Uh, So you kind of started to go into uh, something that I wanted to delve into next, which was TJ Finley's mindset. Now, um, again, this young man made some statements coming in. He said, it's not like I'm going there to be a backup. But he also said that um, he wanted to help make Bo better. And I want you to help us clear something up, Josh, because a lot of fans are confused about what helping Bo better means, or be better means. Now, to me, that means uh, you're going to get better. Or I'm going to take the job from you. <laughs> That's how you help him be better, right? What's TJ Finley's mindset here by choosing to go to Auburn? I mean, he he had some choices. You know, is he looking at this situation and thinking, I can take this job, right? Or I want to play for these coaches or what's the primary driver here for TJ Finley? This is where I disagree with some people who I saw the speculation like you guys probably did. I disagree with the people who say TJ Finley's going there to win the job. And if he doesn't win it, he'll be right back in the portal. I don't believe that's the case. I don't believe that to be the case because if it was, I don't think he would have picked Auburn to begin with. And secondly, because I think there were more favorable quarterback situations out there. And secondly, I don't think you would hear statements come out of his mouth like the one you just said. It was what, what basically, let's break this down. If you are basically, um, I don't want to use the word selfish, but I guess we'll use the word selfish. If your motivations were purely selfish here and it was, I'm going to start or I'm going to be out of there, you don't care about Bo Nix. And it probably wouldn't even come out of your mouth voluntarily, even if you were lying. You wouldn't even think to say, I want to go there and make Bo Nix better. What I think he did is I think Brian Harson and his staff convinced him to buy into Auburn. That's what I think they did, and that's what I hope they did. What that means is he's going to come in there and he's going to crawl over broken glass if he has to to win that starting job. But what he's going to think is, I'm going to play the long game. I got, what does he have, I think five years to play four ultimately still left or something. He's got several years to play. I'm going to play the long game. I see this guy there. If I win the job, that's great. If I lose the job, I want that dude to be good enough where he's out of here and moving on to the next level. So I got a better shot the following year. And at that point, it's going to be me versus this true freshman. And I don't know about him. I mean, we've heard good things, but I've never seen him play. So I think I'm going to be confident enough to at the very least beat him out. And that's not a bad attitude to have because everything I just said, if I were in his head and I were telling you exactly what TJ Finley is thinking, nothing about what just came out of my mouth would be detrimental to Auburn. It would only be a plus. So TJ Finley is saying the right things, but Bo Nix is also saying the right things Uh, on, on, on social media. He posted basically welcome him to the Auburn family. But if you're in Bo Nix's head, what's going through your mind? I think the more interesting potential scenario here is what happens if TJ wins the job. I think a lot of folks were looking at it when the announcement was made and asking, What's TJ Finley going to do if Bo Nix wins the job? Well, we just we just talked about that. So I shared what my sentiment is there. And the fact that I disagree with a lot of people as to how he'd handle it leads me to say what I'm about to say, which is I, I'm purely speculative, of course, and it's just hypotheticals right now. But if that were to happen, 
like, think about this. Let's talk this through for a second. Bo Nix is the Auburn quarterback, man. At no point last year or coming into this year, even when he struggled, did the thought enter his mind or anyone else's mind until very, very recently that it could be anyone other than him this year. The only thing that could derail that we thought would be injury. And so all of a sudden, we get this new cat in here. It's not that he lit the world on fire at LSU. If he did, he'd be the starter down there and, and Miles Brennan or someone else would be transferring. But he comes in, and you're right, Bo Nix said what he needed to say. I think T.J. Finley's there regardless of who wins the job. I, I It would not shock me in the least if Bo Nix were to lose that job to be that name, that Nix name, that to be the one in the transfer portal. That's what I think his mentality would be. I think his mind's in the right place. Don't get me wrong. He's going to compete for the job. But I, I, I know T.J. Finley's got a future there if he doesn't win the job. Bo Nix does not have a future at Auburn if he doesn't win that job. It's that clear to me. Okay, so um, let's switch gears here and start talking about uh, the contrast between these two quarterbacks. So you've got T.J. Finley, who is more of a pr- traditional pocket passer you know he he's he's somewhat athletic he can get away from trouble a little bit but he he is by no means what i would call a dynamic athlete at the qb position and then you have bo Nix, who can be dynamic with his feet at times which one of these guys do you think fits what harson and bobo are going to want to do long term better my answer to this question is not the answer to who i think will start this year because long term i actually think a guy like finley would probably fit their system better I don't think they're going to be able to do what they want to this year. Uh, Unless they pull off some miracles in the portal, I don't think pass pro is going to be nearly where it needs to be on their offensive line to the point where you can afford to have TJ Finley there and consistently operate in that pocket and not have to constantly rely on his legs to either scramble, bail, move the pocket. They're going to have to do a lot of that. I mean, they're going to have to score points somehow this year. I think we're going to probably use the word manufacture a lot with Auburn's offense at times this year. And so – You know, the fact of the matter is, I think the answer to your question long term, if you could pick a mold between one of these two guys, even if it isn't them in and of themselves, I think the T.J. Finley mold is the one they probably want to roll with. But this 2021 Auburn team, you can't be so rigid in this sport as to apply your mold regardless of what the talent roster looks like. You got to mold it around your talent roster. And I think they probably feel semi-confident they can run the ball. They certainly got the horse in the backfield to do it. I think they probably believe they're going to have the offensive line good enough to do it. But, I mean, do they really? I mean, you guys know this better than I do. Do you really think they look around that that war room or that staff room and say, all right, we feel like we can throw it as much as we want to. We're looking at these offensive linemen here. This gives us a warm, fuzzy feeling inside because I think they're terrified by the prospect of trying to do that this year. So, Josh, when we talk about what these guys bring to the table and we've had conversations about uh, some of the challenges that these quarterbacks had. When we seen Finley, to your point, uh, at LSU, when he was under pressure and under duress, things didn't work out well for him. Uh, So it speaks to the challenges that Auburn has up front in pass protection Uh, with Bo Nix. The challenges have been he's able to maneuver and and, ev- and avoid pass protection, but when it comes time to throw the ball under duress or or make the right reads or or timing or accuracy, he's left much to be desired there at times. In your opinion, what is it going to take for either quarterback to overcome the thing that's been holding them back in terms of winning this job and taking hold of that position? I think eventually they're going to get to the spot where – whether it be the first week of camp or second week during the season, they got to just have this thing decided before Penn State. So that's the that's the real start point for the season. And so I think what they're going to look at is they're going to know we don't have a perfect candidate. We don't have a perfect quarterback or even an ideal fit on, for quarterback on this roster. What we got to have is we got to have the ability to play to our strengths. That's going to be running the ball. That's going to hopefully be playing solid enough defense, sort of a complimentary style there. They're going to have to play this year. But – which quarterback gives us the opportunity to do that? Now, for this year's Auburn team, that's going to mean when you break them down on film, if you were to get film of their scrimmages even in fall camp, it may not be obvious to you which one's the right fit because we may watch it and we may say, I just saw TJ Finley do it right on that play. I just saw Bo Nix do it right back to back on this play and that play. They made big third down throws. I don't think that's what that staff's ultimately going to be looking at because I don't think that staff is going to look at either of those quarterbacks and say, he gives us a chance to win games in the SEC with his arm. What I think they're going to do 
is they're going to try and find the guy who through enough repetition shows you that he gets it wrong the least. And he understands that sometimes, sometimes the biggest play for Auburn offensively in a game this year is going to be a second and seven where you throw the ball away and you live to play another down. And that literally, if you look at Bo Nick's track record, that could be the difference in wins and losses. Think about these close games and these picks that he's thrown to earn a, a very degrading nickname that rhymes with his last name. I mean, that stuff, if you just take those plays away and you end the series in a punt for all I care, think about how different some of these Auburn games would already be. So the first thing you got to do is hammer that home. He doesn't have Ruggs and Waddle and Judy and all those kinds of guys out wide. You don't have that. You don't have Evan Neal up front to protect you. So you got to let – you got to let the guys we do have operate. You got to trust the ability to play complimentary football and you cannot get married to your stat sheet. Cause I'm telling you, you're just not going to light it up this year. Um, I, I know there was, <laughs> I know there was that soundbite going around about a month ago about a potential Heisman contender at Auburn. There's no quarterback at Auburn that's going to contend for a Heisman trophy this year, but what you can contend for is winning more football games than they think you will. You're just not going to do it. 48 to 34. If you're going to win them, it's going to be a, a 24, 19, ugly kind of affair. You win any way you can in year one, ugly, pretty, or indifferent. You find ways to win. And then all of a sudden you start, you start hearing these snaps and, and that's recruits turning their heads on the trail. And all of a sudden you get their attention, not after year two or year three, but year one, because you got to be able to sell something. You can only sell vision for so long. You got to be able to, at the very least, take something tangible in nature into a home in Valdosta or Muscle Shoals or anywhere in between and say, look at this. Now, granted, we're scratching the surface. We do not have enough players like you on this team. But if we're even accomplishing more than we should with the team that we have now, it's a bunch of guys we inherited. Imagine what we could be. And imagine what Auburn football could be when we fill that roster out with guys like you. You can't sell that if you're getting skull drugged. But if you're hanging in games and winning games, that's a totally different story. So the quarterback that can put you in position to probably win some ugly games, that's going to be the guy that starts for him. Uh, Josh, I want to uh, talk about uh, the plan for the year because you mentioned something that I want to expound upon a little bit in that they may not be able to do what they want to do this year. But in terms of what they're going to do, do you think that the coaches are developing two separate contingencies in terms of play calling uh, this year, based on who could start be your starter at quarterback at any point in the season, and, and how difficult is that to do to come up with two different game plans essentially to 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 complement your quarterback's particular play style or his strengths? I think the answer is yes. They are certainly probably planning on that. I think since you have a more veteran staff, I don't think it's as hard on the staff. I mean, these guys, truth be told, they've probably been around the block several times doing this. Philosophically, I think the struggle may be getting it in the minds of your players, because when you're trying to overturn a system in general and then you're also telling guys we're going into a season and I need you to be able to even within this new system, be able to play two different brands of football based on who's at quarterback in any given series. And that's how I think it may work potentially this year for him. That could be the tough part. What I wonder, and this, this is going to be one of the great unknowns for Auburn. We talk about being ready by that week three game at Penn State, whether they look at it that way or not, whenever they make their decision, is it a an ironclad final decision or do they arrive at the decision Bo Nix is going to be our starter, but TJ is going to get some reps? Because there's no way that we see this guy smooth sailing us all the way through the season to the point where we never need a spark and we never need a change. Think about last year, Oklahoma ended up winning the Big 12. And yet there was a point last year where Lincoln Riley yanked Spencer Rattler out of the dang Texas game. And so, like, if that stuff can happen for an actual contending team, don't think for a second it can't happen with a first-year staff in there because they don't have anything entrenched. Nothing's entrenched. Nothing's off limits for them. No one, no one has their name permanently attached to any depth chart around there, especially at the quarterback position, I guess. So – I guess my bigger question is not do they have you know multiple game plans? Absolutely, they'll have that. Do they plan on incorporating them, or is it just kind of a, a fail safe? Let's make sure we have it just in case we need it. So, Josh, you you talked about the Penn State game kind of being hypothetically 
the game where the coach makes a decision on who the guy is going to be. And then you talking to, you talked about something that Auburn hasn't had a contingency plan behind quarterback for the past two years, perhaps even longer, whoever the guy's been at Auburn at the quarterback position, he hasn't had to worry or look over his shoulder at who was behind him. He was the guy entrenched uh, come hell or high water. This year, that kind of changes, and it appears that whoever they choose will be on a short leash. Talk about the psyche of what that would do for someone like a Bo Nix or someone like T.J. Finley who's had that happen to him already. To me, it serves as a natural filter because if you've got a guy with the right mentality, it'll only elevate his game. If you got a guy with the wrong mentality, he will buckle under the pressure. But when I say filtration process, that's a good thing. Because ultimately, even though it hurts in the moment to find it out, maybe it's in a game, hopefully it's in a practice, it's much better to find it out as early as possible because you you ultimately find out we, we don't have the guy here that we need. If this kind of thing is enough to rattle him, what are we really doing here? Because we're going to be asking him to lead an entire program, an entire organization. We're going to ask an entire locker room to buy into that guy being our guy. We can't do it. He's too mentally weak. And so, it's again, it's nothing but a good thing for Auburn football. And even if it costs you in the short term this year, that is all about instilling culture. I used to work construction way back in the day, and there were some really ugly days on the construction site. And there were some days where we did stuff we hated, but it always ended in a really pretty looking house. If it didn't, we were in trouble. So it ended in a pretty looking house. And I think about building a football program the same way. If if it takes some losses, even worst case scenario this year, in an effort to weed out the mentally weak pieces on your mm-hmm. roster up to an including quarterback, that's what it takes. Like you, You've got to do it. It's not an option. If you're ever going to get anywhere close to where you want to be, you've got to accomplish it. And, you know, I, we've thrown around two names here, but – you also got to remember, you got Demetrius Davis sitting there. That's also a part of that equation. Maybe not for 2021, but man, long term, I sat at this desk. Uh, I'm in our office. I sat at this desk for like an hour the other day and just watched him. Um, because I, I, one of our Texas scouts, the guys who work the Texas area, I kept hearing him say when I was talking to him about some guys, he kept saying about Davis, he was really polished coming out of high school. He was not raw the way that you would expect. Uh, basically your typical high school quarterback to be, period. Uh, He played a lot of big-time football, got a lot of experience under his belt, and he's not a guy who has to come in and take two or three years to develop before he can ever get on the field. So, again, I think about this in a much broader context because you got him, even if you don't see him much this year, he's observing all this, and he's a part of all this. And so I think long-term, that kid's got as much upside at quarterback as anyone on this roster – And he's a part of whatever that process is going to be this year. Josh, I want to close talking about uh, recruiting and uh, the impact that the decision that these coaches make this year will have on recruiting. So uh, uh, we've talked about this before. You're a recruit and you're watching this, what will be this new iteration of Auburn football's offense this year under Mike Bobo and Brian Harson. What do you need to see from this staff in terms of, offense to say that's where i want to go play my next three to four years of football and on a scale of one to ten how important is it to recruiting that they get this qb battle thing right this year well it's a 10 that they get it right as long as we understand the right decision long term may not yield impressive results this year but again in recruiting if it were as easy as just racking up a lot of points, what you would just go do it and then the recruits would fall in your lap. So the the true skill in recruiting is to sell. Like up the road at Alabama, no one's impressed at this point that Nick Saban lands number one classes. What was impressive is when he got there in 07 and they barely made a bowl game and he walked into Julio Jones' living room and told one of the most historic recruits in the history of that state, I'm going to win with you or without you. You got a spot if you want to come here. And Julio Jones goes there. Julio Jones didn't buy into results. That kid bought into a vision. And so Brian Harson now finds himself in position and his staff too. They're in position where they've got to go out and sell something that is not tangible. In a perfect world, what would happen is you'd start to get better than expected results on the field this year. If that happens, it probably gets a little bit easier. 
but let, let's just say the Auburn season this year is one where you know you're, you're midway through the year having to recalibrate your expectations and let's say seven wins, eight wins, like that that's going to be looked at recalibration wise as a really good year. How can you go out on the trail anyway and say, I know what our record says, but I want to show you this, 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 and this. And I want to tell you some things that are happening behind the scenes there. And I want you to listen to some testimonials, even from guys who are on our roster right now. Be around our team. Come hang out with our team and our roster. And you ask them. But a lot of those dudes have no reason to lie to you. If you even if you don't trust us yet, trust those guys. That's where the skill is. That's where the skill and the talent in recruiting is. And so, yeah, it's important they get quarterback figured out. Absolutely. But what's more important is they get it figured out for just the long-term prospects of Auburn. Because if you're doing that, you'll notice the best staffs do this. They think a lot more in the macro because if you get the big picture figured out, all this other stuff, recruiting, namely, should fall into place if you're doing it right. Well, Josh, listen, uh, we really appreciate you joining us to talk a little bit about Auburn's quarterback battle. I know we're all going to be on pins and needles as the season approaches to see uh, what happens there between uh, Bo and TJ and not to be forgotten, Demetrius Davis, in case of emergency. So uh, thanks for joining us today, Josh. We appreciate it. Absolutely, guys. Anytime. I appreciate it. Well, as always, we are The War Report. Please hit like and subscribe. We are The War, War Report on Twitter and Instagram. TW Report on TikTok. Gentlemen, we're signing off, and as always, War Eagle. War Eagle.